how many beers do you figure you can fit in that cup? A lot. Like it is huge. <laughs> you could fit a cube of pills in there. That's and it's you, like not plastic. green diesel. Is that what it's you guys call it? Green diesel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fill that thing up. I want to see some party time of it. That'll oh, be yeah, a good be thumbnail. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's we'll happening for sure. Welcome to Get the Net, a fishing podcast that takes a deep dive into competitive events, fishing news, tips, tactics, and most importantly, interviews with some of the most interesting and in-tuned anglers from Canada to the central U.S. We're leaving no stone unturned to bring you the most raw and authentic talk talk. My name is Jamie Bruce, while my resume says bass, my frying pan says walleye, I'm no stranger to the multi-species realm. Whether you're puttering on tackle, driving the bus, cutting the grass, or killing time in a 9 to 5, we'll try to give you something in every episode to take with you on the water, or at the very least, bring you a few laughs. All right, welcome back everyone to Get the Net. Got a quality show lined up for you tonight. We've got Adam Crawford and Clayton Schick, uh, Game of Inches champions, hardcore ice anglers, both beauties. We're going to get them on in a bit. Going to have a good chat with those boys for sure going to talk a little salt water a little ice conditions a little bass master definitely going to want to stick around i hope you guys have been enjoying the mix on the show lately it's uh it's been fun talking to to all these people i definitely have been you know been looking forward to to show night just a really good variety of of guests and uh you know there's there's beauties buried in in all corners of the fishing world so we're going to keep on pulling them out and hopefully they keep coming because this has been a lot of fun um you know not just being married to an archetype of guest or anything like that. So yeah, been really fun. Hope, uh, hope everyone's been enjoying it. I know I have, but yeah, I just got back to frozen life was, uh, down in Mexico for a week down there for a wedding. It was kind of like my last couple of days off before, uh, you know, 2023 starts. If, you know, if you haven't been following the show, it's, uh, it's going to be a busy year. We're going to work full time and compete in the 2023 Bassmaster Opens and going to keep bringing podcasts and content and things like that. So really not going to have a day off next year. So I was like, oh yeah, we'll go down, you know, December, have a nice trip, nice little wedding, you know, lots of beach time. Didn't even bring a fishing rod. I was like, I don't want to think about fishing. <laughs> you know, I just want to relax. You know, didn't bring my laptop or anything. You know, last time I went to Mexico, I, I bought a little pack rod and was casting off the beach and catching some weird shit. And, uh, I was like, yeah, I'm not even going to do that this time. I'm going to get enough fishing next year. I'm not, not even going to try it. And yeah, a couple days in already thinking about fishing, already regretting not bringing the rod. Gussie lined us up a fishing trip a couple days in. It was pretty sweet. Those deep sea, like speed trolling adventures are not my cup of tea at all. Um, you know, I've been on them before and you just sit there and like, you're trolling some stupid squid six miles an hour across the top of the surface and the prop wash of the boat and just like sitting there, you know, no, no effort, no, nothing, you know, you can really do. And anytime I've done it, we haven't caught anything. So that's kind of what <laughs> I thought we were getting into, you know, pretty much just, uh, just hanging out with the boys, but we got, uh, we got lucky. We got a couple like buddy got a mahi mahi we lit up one of those little bonita things and then it was like on the give up troll on the way back to to the marina and we doffed a big marlin um not a big marlin by their standards but definitely the biggest fish i've ever seen it was uh it was pretty wild um i was standing on the back deck at the time uh you know we let the groom's father and the groom reel in the first two and my dumb ass just happened to be standing there when the, when the Marlin went off and I thought I was just going to catch another Bonita and I grabbed the rod and, you know, there's a seven foot Marlin leaping out of the water. So battled that thing to the boat. Um, and I didn't really know, like, I just assume they keep everything down there. That's kind of, you know, been my experience from what I've heard and what I've seen, but they're like, yeah, we can release it. So yeah, we're like, yeah, okay, we'll release it. And the guides were battling it at the you know, on like the back deck of the boat and it got a little bit beat up, you know, got some, da- some head damage and they're like, yeah, oh, this thing's not going to swim. So, um, yeah, we put her on ice and kept the biggest fish I've ever seen. Not, uh, not really something I expected I do, but we wheeled that sucker up to the marina, 
they have like big laundry tubs on uh on these carts and like you go you know we're big dogging through the marina the things like folded in half in a tub big pokey schnoz on one side and a tail sticking out the other and went and got her carved up and uh, just half of the thing fed like 30 people it's quality quality eats too i'm not like a big fish eater moral of the story you can't get away from fishing if you're addicted to it i tried i can't um definitely bring a rod if you go to those places i was watching like you know, a little fish in the surf and everything. And it was, it was driving me nuts. You can only sit there and crush pina coladas for, you know, for so long. So anyway, came back into the weekend and, uh, got out on the ice with my buddy, Sean McGaw and his family, um, went and kind of scouted around Lake of the Woods a little bit. Conditions were pretty garbage. There's a lot of snow on top of not a lot of ice. So lots of slush already. Um, Went out and did a, a YouTube video. It's up on my channel, a little perch slinging with uh, with my buddy Hank. And yeah, it was a nightmare. Like, you know, I'm I'm complaining about it. It's nothing compared to like, you know, early March slush or anything like that. Um, but just to have that much slush this time of year, like we're used to easy travel right now. And I almost ran out of gas on my snow machine. My uh, sleigh shack was just like a cube, um, you know everything was working hard and man just not not great fishing was good so um no complaints there but as far as ice conditions go um one of the main guys Leonard Boucher just put up a post today and he'd been checking all over the lake and you know kind of the the a good year you get the ice roads in around Christmas that's not looking like it's going to happen this year uh might be a little bit later probably right around the new year so Hopefully, uh, winter eases up a little bit. I don't think anyone wants to deal with the hell tour we had to deal with last year. You know, if that's the case, it just makes everything so hard and exploring gets tough and things just get more dangerous out there and yeah, no good. So hoping that this is the worst of it for the year. Cause yeah, it's a pretty unfriendly reminder of, uh, you know, how rough it can be out there, especially if you're trying to lube tube, um, you know, make videos and things like that, like all the gear you have to bring and extra steps you have to take we're going to talk to uh our guest tonight a little bit about that and speaking of the slush out there um if you've ever tried to drill holes in slushy conditions you'll know that it's not very fun with uh you know conventional ice augers i uh really like the strike master 40 volt for that it's got tons of torque uh you know it's just kind of that steady pull uh all that extra weight of water on top of the ice and the slush and can really bind up uh your gears and your motor and everything and that strike master 40 volt is pretty much designed for it so definitely check those out or if you want to win one all you have to do is subscribe to my youtube channel if you're listening on youtube just slide down hit subscribe turn your notifications on if you're on spotify apple anything like that wheeler on over to the lube tube channel hit subscribe automatically enter that's all you have to do if you want to share it to facebook or instagram i'll pluck your name out throw you in for a double round um you know increase your chances of uh of winning that auger but i'm going to draw it on january 1st and it's just out of the subscriber pool so it's really not a a deep pool and you've got a really good chance at winning a brand new strike master 40 volt lithium ice auger so pretty sweet deal all you have to do is subscribe super easy definitely check that out if you don't want to wait till then they've got a ton of them at uh, lake of the wood sports or sportsheadquarters.ca and moving forward, we'll touch on Nordic Point Lodge. Keep an eye out for the website to come, but, uh, you know, coming up in the next couple of months, it's a good time to start looking at booking a trip. You know, the primo dates fill up fast, so definitely worth a look. It's in northwestern Ontario. You know, they have all the comforts of home. You don't have to rough it. It's fine dining, private cabins, sauna, fitness center, elite fleet of boats, high-end stuff. Definitely worth a look. I'll uh, throw some info down in the description below. And don't forget to check out www.btfishing.com. The herd's been ravenous on the on the primo skews, so we're just restocking now. We just got a huge shipment in. Uh, everything will start getting entered, you know, as we go here. So uh, keep an eye out for that on your favorite sizes, colors, couple new sizes too uh clock shots have been banging people are starting to catch on to that a little bit so definitely have some of those in stock smeltinator jigs uh 
good time to stock up. People go wild for them, especially around Bassmaster Classic time. There's probably going to be a lot of hype, so definitely worth grabbing now. If you use promo code Get the Net, all capitals at checkout, get yourself an extra 10% off and free shipping in Canada and the U.S. www.btfishing.com. And another thing to watch out for this spring is the uh, the G-Man Meta series from 13 Fishing Rod series, and then the Inception G2 G-Man Reel. Uh, got my mitts on a couple. You can see there's a box right there. I've been in the garage doing some flipping, you know, dialing, trying to dial stuff in a little bit, getting ready for uh, for the Derby season. And man, this is nice stuff. Uh, first time putting hands on it. Uh, it's all, you know, all has that high end feel and, you know, I'm, I've been flipping around the garage and everything feels good. And, uh, you know, at a really competitive price point, they're 150 us uh, rods. So, uh, definitely hard to beat. Uh, you're going to probably agree when you pick one up, they're super nice, kind of have all the bases covered. You know, I've kind of been bouncing between getting ice fishing gear organized and, and getting my summer stuff together. And I'm definitely leaning leaning towards the open water stuff right now it uh it's starting to get me riled up even though i got a couple months to uh to go it's uh getting all this gear spooled up with nice new suffix and everything like that i'm i'm uh i'm ready to go on to put them to work i don't really want to use the short rods but that's uh that's the way she goes it just makes the open water that much sweeter so don't forget to keep an eye out for those that's the 13 Fishing Meta Series and Inception G2 Reels. It's uh, almost lake trout season, another 10 days till lake trout season opens up. Uh, if you're looking at booking a trip, got to remind you about Crawford's Camp. Uh, you know, I refer all my guests there, uh, you know, and past guests and buddies for guiding. They've got fully winterized, renoed cabins. Uh, you know, Matt will dial you in on, on what you need to be doing for lake trout. He's always out there checking ice conditions uh, has a really good bead on the area. Trout bites phenomenal around there. So definitely my favorite place to go in the winter. I'm going to be doing a trip there mid January, really looking forward to it. They fill up fast. So don't wait too long. Check out Crawford's camps in Sunaros. And while we're on the topic of hopping all over the place, going ice fishing, definitely not a bad idea to look at Dryden right now. If you're looking for a crappie boom experience, check out Wabagoon Lake in Dryden, Ontario and surrounding lakes. Um, you know, it's kind of been a hidden gem over, over the last few years. I'm heading there early February. Can't wait to get out there. Uh, you know, when I was in Dryden for the Wally Masters this year, we stumbled across a couple like giant crappies and, uh, man, it's, it's the place to be for that. Obviously the walleyes and everything are, are good as well, but that crappie population's booming and, you know, that's the place to be. There's uh, tons of places to stay and eat and, and definitely uh, definitely worth checking out. So keep an eye out for that video coming later this winter. Uh, really looking forward to it and can't wait to dedicate a, a weekend to just fishing on Wabagoon. But anyway, let's take it over to Saskatchewan now and bring on our guests, Adam Crawford and Clayton Chick. Is, it, is my audio working? Hell yeah, bud. You sound better than me. Look at that oh. hunk of hardware behind you. Perfect. It's coming through the speakers. This is good. I'm going to wear my headphones. Good. Yeah, right? <laughs> Adam hasn't even got to touch it yet. Yeah, it's no on mitts that. on it yet, hey? No. It's going to just, I'm going to, can't wait to hand it over to him. It's going to be beer drink out of that thing for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When's the ceremony? When are you passing the torch to him? I don't know. Whenever we get together for a, a fish at some point. It's for sure going to sit in his garage during the summers when I'm up north, 100%. And that's when he usually has most of his buddies in the garage anyway there. So it'll be good. It kind of makes those little trophies you got behind you there pretty look pretty small, hey? Jeez. Yeah, I know. They're even like the same. <laughs> the KBI ones, even yeah. though, like they look the same. And, just, and, like, and that one like means a lot more to this. And this thing's like... <laughs> <laughs> so, so when they when I saw that trophy when I got down there, I was like, oh my god, these guys went all out. It was kind of cool. Yeah, well, they're not going to have a trophy ceremony and hand you a little piddly like yeah. piece of junk. It was cool for sure. They make did sure right. you take care of it better than Joe Cooper took care of the musky cup. Right. No, this one will get taken care of for sure. Nice, nice. Well, congratulations again. Um, we've got Clayton Schick. And Adam Crawford, uh, may as well introduce you guys proper as the Game of Inches champions. <laughs> Fists in the air. We um, can retire now. We're done. One and done. 
Yeah. Still yeah. Oh, it's good to have you guys on. I texted Adam after like two episodes and I was like, Hey, if you make the top five, you want to come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We definitely were going to finish top five for sure. After Aaron dropped out. So we were good. We had that long. Yeah. Time. Did he drop out in the Derby or just. No, nope, just... afterwards. And I'm sure that's one of those things that we can cover like right away. Aaron was like, you don't filmed... have to. No, no, like... it's, it's fine. But people want to know, right? Like people ask all the time and it's like, it's obviously like, the most asked questions that we get and it's so annoying but it is part of it aaron was part of the whole project he filmed videos the whole time he just when it came to edit them he decided that he didn't want to edit them and that's really all we know he was like just like i'm not going to be producing any videos for it and that was it so that's all they're literally all there is to it i can relate to that that's a lot just, of footage <laughs> it, it is for sure right so God. i uh um, there's a lot of people, like I got one message. It was like, well, how do we know Aaron didn't win? I'm like, cause he probably would have edited his videos if he would have won. Like, so yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's my opinion. So who knows? Anyways, it's going to yeah. get out oh, well. at some point. It's probably going to be in the comments of your, of your videos. Like, well, what happened to Aaron's video? So there we talked about it and now we can move on. It's good. Yeah. You want to get all the contentious issues out of the way right away? Parrot? Those are other ones too. I like it. <laughs> Them all yeah, we're... <laughs> I know Peric is okay because I saw him a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so Peric thing, yeah. So here's how here's how I, I viewed the whole competition in general. If some team needed to tap out two days in because they were worn out, it, it's whatever, that's fine. It's their story. I'm not mad at Alex for leaving. I was upset with Alex for leaving and not telling anybody. He mm. just you know, he just took off in the middle of the night. If he wasn't doing good, man, it's a grind, right? When you do that for five days in a row, there's a lot going on. He made the mistake of not telling anybody, of just piecing out, and we're all sit, sat there to worry about it. But on that end, Alex called me personally afterwards and cleared the air and apologized. To me, that's more than anything. If you can man up to your mistakes. We all make mistakes. We're all humans. If you can man up to it, to me, that's the most important part. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. I uh, I had no idea that was going on because I saw you guys all together at the ice fishing show. And then, uh, you know, I had been following closely. Like, you know, I school girled it pretty good. Like, I watched nice. it every Monday. You know, it was a thing. I, I definitely didn't think that, you know, it was possible to have like a, you know, almost like a cult-like following you know, on, on YouTube, it's the first time I've seen it since 39 hours, uh, you know, and it was a really unique deal for those of you that, uh, that maybe haven't seen game of inches or, uh, you know, don't really understand it. I'll, uh, maybe I'll let Clayton just break it down for you quick, just before, cause we're going to dive pretty deep here. So we may as sure. well uh, get her so, out of the way quick. Game of inches. Uh, it was kind of a concept that Jay came up with for the most part in terms of, he wanted to really connect all of the YouTube channels together somehow. We can all contribute in some way or another, right? Like obviously a 39 hour style would be amazing, but that only goes on to one channel and we couldn't really hit everybody's audience that way. And obviously some of us have the same audiences, but some of us have different audiences too. So we came up with this little competition that six teams ended up being five teams in the end, but we went out for a five day ice fishing adventure. We all fished from an hour before, or you're allowed to fish, not that everybody did, an hour before sun, sun up and to an hour after sunset. And in, during these five days, it was a competition to see who could catch the most total inches of seven combined species. And your species were a walleye, were an esox, so that's either pike or a muskie. There was a whitefish and cisco category. There was a burbot category. There was a lake trout category. There was a stock trout category. And there was a panfish category. Panfish consisted of uh, perch and crappie. Some of us don't have crappie in our region. Some people do, just like the whole muskie. Some people had muskie that were open and some people didn't. Yeah. So during those five days, each team was kind of like, you're almost like a competition against yourself, even though you're competing against other people, but you were trying to get the biggest walleye you could, the, big, the biggest esox, the biggest fish out of each category. And what that would do is you would stack up all of your total inches to see who could catch the most total inches at the end of the five days. Does that yeah. sum it up? Does that kind of yep. sum it up? Yeah, that's a good job. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was fun to watch. There's there's nothing like it. I mean, as far as ice fishing tournaments go, there's 
you know, there's the Keystone deal that's firing up where you can got, kind of go wherever. And before that, it was just kind of pre-drilled, you know, pre-drilled holes. And that's that's a derby. But uh, you guys obviously love competition. Uh, I love the competitive aspect of it. And, man, it's just so sweet to see it combined on the ice. Uh, cause that's kind of been the, for me in ice fishing, that's kind of been the one thing that's missing is that, that competitive component. So that's why I went so nuts for it, but obviously totally. a couple hundred other thousand people felt the same way. Cause that thing's banging on the tube, man. It, it, it's a way to like, day. it's a way to involve competition to ice fishing was still keeping fish safety a little bit too. Right. Cause a lot of times in those, those ice fishing tournaments, you catch a fish, it gets thrown in a bucket or a tub, ran all the way to the way station wade you know by the time it gets released it's pretty much dead this way we could like you know take good care of it measure it right by the hole obviously we were allowed to measure a lot of stuff outside because our conditions were nice and warm but if it was cold we would have been doing a tent and that's how that keystone tournament is too right it's a catch and release format where you're measuring them quick on your bump board they make sure to tell you that you have to have a good release video of it and everything right so yeah we, we have now. to as a competitive angler, as you know, for sure in the bass worlds, like we also have a huge priority of like taking care of the fish too. Right. Like we have to. Be yeah. Honest. Yeah, man. You guys had that dialed too. You could tell that was a priority, especially on that big lake trout too. Um, you know, here on Lake of the woods, most of the lake trout areas, you're actually not even allowed to use bait. Um, and when you do get one, like kind of swim through your pike, you know, pike tip up, it's always a carnage and, uh, anytime I see a lake trout on a, on a quick strike rig, I'm always kind of cringy. And that thing was just like, boop, boop, like yeah. in and, and, and out. And then just and right I, back down the hole. I try to show that with everything, right? Like I know there was one comment. It was like, how come you took so long to pull it out of the hole? Like get it out. And it's like, no, it was, it was good where it was. Once it was in my hands, it wasn't going anywhere. It was over. Yeah. So you don't have like, to do the big, like panic, throw it on the ice and then exactly. what? <laughs> and I've always been a firm believer of like hitting those, hitting your lake trout early and like as soon as it started to move with that bait i hit it like i wasn't giving him a chance to swallow it right because my theory has always yeah. been if the fish is big enough that bait is going to be somewhere in its mouth where you're going to want you know it's going to be a caught fish if it's if it's a smaller fish the fish the bait's going to be somewhere on the outside of his mouth and it probably does you a favor if it comes off anyway yeah yeah fair enough um so you fish with adam i uh, i had a story on one of the podcasts here about when i first met adam uh, it was at the Winnipeg ice fishing shows when, when I first met you too, it was a couple minutes later. Uh, you know, he just wheeled over and was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, uh, bullshit a little bit. And, uh, later on he had like a shirt with a picture of you and him on it. Like that stepbrother shirt. I was like, holy shit. Step, this guy's step up. anglers. Yeah. Step anglers. <laughs> and I saw, yeah, there it is. So I saw all the, all the CSO booths set up. Uh, Adam had just come up to me and kind of talked and, uh, you know, saw the shirt later. I was like, this guy's a mega YouTube fan. <laughs> He's got Clayton <laughs> stick on his shirt. I had no idea, dude, until uh, like I came back to the screening. I had no idea that he was your partner. <laughs> that's funny yeah <laughs> yeah and he's like yeah i came from saskatchewan to the ice fishing show i was like holy man this guy's a fan fan of the sport <laughs> i didn't realize you you know you're in game of inches and we're about to win the damn thing and i had adam think, i had adam's face on my shirt too <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i just figured yeah. you were selling those and yeah i don't know <laughs> Just some random dude, hey, with a step angler angler's hoodie on, ripping yeah. around, yeah. No, a yeah. Adam and I, we've been like, how long have we been fishing together? A couple of years now, I think. Yeah, maybe four or three. three. I'm like, I don't fish with very many people, like ever. Yeah. But I'll like actually call up Adam and be like, hey, I'm going to X Lake. You know, like you want to meet for the day or whatever. Whether I get him on the video or not, or whether he's just hanging out and fishing, but I don't really. I don't really fish with many people. It's just so hard when you're filming, as you know, right? To include somebody all the time. Yeah. Yeah. How was that for you? Have you ever like filmed before? Cause that's, I mean, the YouTube thing is, uh, you know, it, it just adds a dynamic that people really don't see and realize. And, uh, you know, I was pretty naive to it for until I started doing it. It's like, okay, this is twice the work or more yeah. just on the water. It's you guys didn't have a camera guy. No, it, it just adds that much more, right, to the whole experience. And when I first started with Clay, it was, 
definitely interesting. All of a sudden, you're getting mic'd up in the morning, and he's kind of showing you how to do it. And then by, you know, day two or three, you kind of got it figured out and setting the cameras up in the shacks, and batteries are dying, and, you know, Clay's running around changing those out. And, yeah, it's definitely different. And then you have to be kind of on your game, too. Like, you're there's no cursing, and, you know, it's not PG-13, but you're trying your best to keep it together. You know, throughout a long day, and usually you're in your shack by yourself, just kind of staring at the walls, and your buddy's, you know, 20 feet away or whatever. So it's, yeah, it definitely adds to it, and it's you, you take it serious too, right? You want to catch a big fish and make the video successful and, you know, and, and have people watch it, and, you know, you don't want to show up and just kind of make a mediocre vehicle or video and, and you know, kind of whatever. You're there to make a, make a banger, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. Talking, hell yeah. I saw the effort too. I saw you hustling yeah. back to back and grabbing the tripod and like ripping around and I'm like, I'm, I'm looking, watching and I'm just like, <laughs> Oh yeah, he's getting the, the YouTube experience. Like, <laughs> and well, it's and so funny. Turning mode too, right? Yeah. Turn, turning mode. Exactly. It's totally. Yeah. Different. Like it's and not it's like that. You, like we all know what it's like and it's, there's no just kind of friend mode. It's like, Hey, this is happening now. You know, there's no time to spare sort of thing. So yeah, it, it was, there was definitely serious moments and times where you're like, holy shit, you know, like, <laughs> keep it together I felt, here. Yeah. I felt so bad because, like, I'm editing it all and I'm, like, telling Adam, I'm like, grab the bump order, grab this. And it's like, you can tell he's, like, rushing and I'm like, it's okay, we got lots of time, you know, don't don't rush, <laughs> we're good. It's like, but it's just like, you go through those whole steps, right? Because we're obviously, we talked already covered, but you're already thinking about the fish's safety too. It's like, let's be completely prepared for everything, right? So. Mm -hmm. yeah and like normal socially acceptable standards of conduct and how you interact with your buddies go out the window in a tournament too <laughs> like totally. i i yeah. saw that with i saw that with you guys i you know i go through footage of me fishing with my buddies who maybe don't fish that much and i'll drag them into a big tournament and like i'm barking at them and <laughs> you know it's just <laughs> it's just like it's a totally different thing and when people people see the maybe see the video they're like oh man don't look like you're very fun to fish with but i can totally right, we were relate. we're serious there's a lot of people that were like wow you guys were so serious but it's like mm -hmm. it yeah. was it was it we were in like we were literally in you know competition mode it was just a completely different atmosphere right like i've caught multiple 29 inch walleye or even 40 inch lake trout right like but when i watched the editing i was just like my emotions were insane like it's like holy cow it just obviously you're on a completely different level when it was competition yeah yeah and usually you're not catching there's no comp you know there's the odd musky tournament or you know in a, a walleye tournament where you might get a high-end fish but like usually you're not catching a trophy class fish like that in a tournament you know a, a 30 pound lake trout is not something you're ever catching in a tournament you right. can usually just kick back and relax and enjoy the fight but <laughs> yeah that looked intense like you must have had some shakes <laughs> going on at some point i was i was yeah, a little, I was a little bit nervous at first. Like, I've I fought enough big lake trout that I kind of had an idea. Like, once we got into it, it was like something crazy was going to have to happen for it to come off. Like, once my only concern was ever was getting a hook caught on the bottom of the ice. I was never worried about a hook coming off like during the fight with yeah. it being a bait it was just a it was a treble hook right it's not like he could create any leverage on the lure or anything like that like once it's in there like it's in there but there's obviously stuff can happen I I trust my knots and that stuff right like I, I knock on wood but I've never had like one break off because of stupidity right like obviously it can happen you know stuff happens but in that sense I was confident it was obviously nerve it was nerve-wracking for sure yeah <laughs> yeah when adam was fighting burbot um like the first couple he caught I, this must have been the first couple fish he caught with you in the in the tournament and uh it was like it was so intense like catching 23 inch burbot <laughs> you know, you're like oh tighten your drag we got good line tighten it up and it's like full coaching moment over 24 inch burbot it was so funny i was i was into it um but you know you could see that like i said i watched them all uh know most of the guys that that were fishing it and you could just see that like how bad you guys wanted it <laughs> you know I, that was, I would that say was the, very that it was like we we obviously wanted to win but it was like after we iced the walleye 
that's when it was like okay now it's like now it's go time because in my mind you needed to have at least one or two good fish in the first couple of days where you didn't have to worry about the species anymore if you, yeah. if you didn't have any good fish you know after two days you know without a contender you were you're gonna struggle right so once we iced that wall it was like also my i could see it in my eyes i'm like we can do this now we can win now that yeah. walleye bite was just so stressful and annoying almost just um, crank, crank it back around, head back north, drill another 30 holes, you know, find any. And yeah, we luckily, had luckily, yeah, the tip off middle of the day, too. <laughs> we, yeah, we had pre fished yeah. for, for two days before the, the tournament, and okay, I was gonna we, ask that. we, uh, we didn't find very much for like walleye. We had a pretty good pike bite, a pretty good bourbon bite. We had some decent walleye, yeah. but it was just like every morning, I like, go well, for the two mornings of competition. It's like, okay, this is going to happen or, you know, the, at night. And then for it not to happen, like that was like a huge, like that was a huge blow in the sails, right? Like it was like, oh, man, we're not going to get our walleye. And then when it did, it's just like, are you kidding me? Midday, like you said, like. And we were just talking about that literally like 15 minutes earlier. Just a bunch of the audio was bad. It couldn't be in the video, but we're like, how can we never get lucky and get a big wally on the tip up? Hey, eh? and it was like, yeah, the next one. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, when it's meant yeah. to be, it's meant to be. How far were you guys traveling in between? Like, like for, for the like, so where we started the derby. We were on Last Mountain, and when we finished, we were up at Baker's. I think it's like 500 miles, I think, by the end. So after the first day, we fished, we fished Last Mountain for the first day. And then the second day, we stayed on Last Mountain. We were staying on a cabin right there, so we didn't have far to go. But at about 5 o'clock, we packed everything up, drove half of the way to our next destination. So it was two hours, two and a half hours. And then the next morning, we got up really early. We had about an hour and a half, hour and 45-minute ride to the Trout Lake for that day. And then once we were finished with the trout that day, we had probably about five and a half hours up to Baker's from there. So it was a lot, but we were smart and we didn't like do it overnight. Like we made, we planned it a little bit. We got lucky and obviously got a good stock trout uh, early enough in the day that we could pack up and go. Cause I was dreading like waiting there till like five, six o'clock and then driving to Baker's. Right. It was like, Oh my goodness, this is going to be painful. Yeah. It's, man, everything seemed to fall in place pretty good. Like, it's easy to think about it uh, and plan it in your head how it's going to work out. You know, I will go get a 40 inch pike here and then we'll be a lake trout here. And you see that with the, like, I don't know if you watched, uh, if you watch Cooper and Winter on Lake. I wa- watched Lake. them all totally. Yeah. So I'm watching where they're going. I'm like, these guys are backtracking 40 miles. Like, because really? I can tell in the background, I'm like, they're going 40 miles back and forth. And oh. I'm like, oh my God. I like, you could tell, and all their plans were sound. Uh, they made perfect sense. And j- it just didn't work out. And, and just one species not working out just sent it, like, sends them into a tailspin and they're, they're toast. Like, that, that's you know, like, that's like Jay with his lake trout. You know, even though they had exactly. flood issues, right? Like they they catch a, a 35 inch lake trout that first night when they're going for them. All of a sudden they have two days to go upgrade their pike and their walleye and their burbot, right? Like you literally needed like the perfect seven bites, right? And they had to happen at the right time, right? And you need a little bit of luck, obviously, too, with some of your bites. So yeah, it was like, yeah, and, I mean that's factors into everything. But... Yeah. And our like our strategy was to start on a lake where we could catch the most amount of species and then possibly get a couple lucky bites in that sense. Right? Like we started in an area where we had, we had walleye, perch, ciscos and pike that we could have caught and bourbon all out of that same spot. So in my mind, it was like, let's fish that spot. Let's get one or two good bites, lucky bites, and then pick apart your species as you went, not start on your hardest fish right away or something like that. So. Yeah. It's kind of like when you play, 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 uh, play beer pong you just throw it you just send it in the middle whichever cup it lands in you're good right like hey we got one now you have to aim at the other cups though but first one you're just you just send them darts right like yeah yeah i like Get that way. <laughs> right that's that's what i would compare it to beer pong <laughs> <laughs> oh that's unreal um of all the places you fished did 
had had you fished them all before and and found those spots or did info play um you know i know there's there's obviously a lot of info is a big deal on when you have to cover a spread like that um you know having a having a network and um nobody really has that many spots that i know of that have trophy class fish did you get a, like a any info or did was it just stuff you've already found stuff everything we found was stuff that we have fished in the past where we did catch the big walleye i was talking to a friend like two or three nights before and i was set up a little bit further into the bay for pike because we were going there for pike and yeah. he's like you should really try a little bit further out on the point because you got a chance at burbot and stuff right so as well so where we where we caught it it had a lot to do obviously with conversations but it's like you're you're always having those conversations right it's like so it's not like somebody gave us like a waypoint and was like fish right here right you just go through those talks right and then you kind of spin your own web as you go and figure stuff out but um the other but the the lake trout bite i had fished there a spot uh previously but it is a spot that mac from bakers and arrows had taken me to it's not a spot i found on my own at, at right. all by any means but i had fished there uh, a couple months earlier and caught a nice fish there so i went we went back there uh the white fish was a spot that we just come across literally like we had never i still have never caught a white fish through the ice ever no that kidding. Was literally, yeah that was like, my favorite part of the whole the whole deal was when like uh you know you guys hadn't to my knowledge you were the only team at the time that hadn't been in a portable shack uh, yes we we were not set one up on that last day or whatever like you pretty much already had her lapped up and then it was like I think you were like, all right, let's go run points for whitefish. The wind's like just gas and sideways, like blowing everything over. You guys just look like a couple drowned rats, like just bagged out day five, uh, you know, ready to be done with this. And you're like, oh, let's go run points for whitefish. I've never caught a whitefish in this lake. And Adam's like, that sounds freaking terrible. And I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> and it was. 